in correcting, warning, and urging, and encouraging them, being unflagging and inexhaustible in patience and in teaching. The time is coming. I want you to hear this. The time is coming when people will not tolerate, will not endure sound and wholesome instructions. But they will have inching ears for something that is pleasing, something that is gratifying. They will gather to themselves one teacher after another to a considerable number chosen to satisfy their own liking and to foster the errors that they hold. And they will turn aside from hearing the truth and they will wander off into myths and man-made man -made fictions. As for you, be calm and cool and be steady, accept, suffer unflinchingly every hardship, and do the work of evangelists, and fully perform all the duties of your ministry. Now, one of the things that, that I want to make you aware of is that we are living in this day, right? This day is not coming. It's here right now, right? When the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to Timothy, he wrote this letter in the mindset that this day would come, right? This day came in Timothy's day, and it has intensified up until this point in our day. Right? This is not something that, that, that we are looking forward to seeing. It's happening right as we stand here today. Right? One thing I need to say, among many other things I would say today, is that God never changed. Right? He never changed. The Bible says that God is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. All right? He doesn't change. Time moves, but time don't change God. Right? God said that his word is unchangeable. Right? You should get this. God's word is unchangeable. So God is his word. Because the Bible says that the word became flesh, and Jesus was the manifestation of God. That's what the Bible says. All right? So God's word doesn't change. Bible says over in Matthew's gospel, it says heaven and earth will pass away. Because in Matthew 5, it says, but my word shall never ever pass away. Not one jot, not one tittle of God's word will pass away. Right? We have to establish these type things is because the very foundation of what our faith is built upon is being tested right now. Right? Some of the most simple things that you learn in vacation Bible school is being tested right now. Right? When the enemy wants to destroy something, his intention is always to mess with foundational truths. Right? You want to mess with what's foundation. Because if he can destroy the foundation of it, he can bring the whole building down. Well, let me tell you something. God has... And he is raising up men and women of God that will be foundational in their teaching to bring a greater support system concerning God's word. All right? God is raising up people right now that's going to know what's true. It's going to operate in what's true. And so he says here, the writer here, Paul says, uh, in Timothy, he says that, that, his job is to preach God's word and, and, to, and to keep a sense of urgency. We, we must have a sense of urgency, guys. We must have an, a sense of urgency to have everything we need at a, at ready right now. Right? Don't, don't wait to get ready. Get ready right now. Right? The devil is coming right now. He's not coming, uh, waiting next week. He's coming right now. Is everybody following? All right. So he said that his job is to present this message, whether it's convenient or inconvenient. Right? So guess what? If the word of God seemed to inconvenience you, all right, it's not my fault. Let me say that again. It's not my fault. Because people turn on the preacher, people turn on the preacher or betray the man or woman of God, it's because they don't agree with what they're saying. But the Bible says here, 
Paul told Timothy, he said, whether it's welcome or unwelcome, you still preach the truth. He said, whether it's convenient or whether it's inconvenient. We're always talking about the conveniency of people. God is not concerned with the conveniency of mankind. The Bible tells me here that it's our job to preach the word in season and out of season. When it's welcome and when it's unwelcome. Amen. That's our responsibility. All right? He goes on to say that your job is to tell people what's wrong in their life. Now, I've heard preachers say their job is not to tell people what's wrong. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says that my job as a preacher is to tell people what's wrong, but I don't stop there. Because when I expose to you by the Spirit what's wrong in your life, my job is to help you bring correction where you're wrong. It's kind of like somebody in a classroom, and you're working on a problem, and all of a sudden you realize, the instructor realizes that your problem is wrong. They're not going to sit there and say you're wrong and not try to help you. Their job is to tell us where we're wrong and give us the right information. I want you guys to hear what God is saying to you today. Right? Many of us, we've been wrong in a lot of areas in our life. We've been told the wrong things in a lot of areas in our life. But we have to be willing to conform to God's way versus being fixed in man's way. Man has its own way. Humanity has its own way. But God has his way. Right? And we want to follow God. And just because we read something in the Bible a certain way doesn't mean just because they preached it that way that it was legitimate. I mean, you can take things and you can put your spin on it. You can take the word of God and you can kind of make it say what you want it to say. But we don't want to make God's word say what we want it to say. We want God's word to say what he wanted to say. There's so many people that are putting twists and spins on God's word. And you can change a little bit and a little leaven, a little leaven, leaven it the whole loaf. A little corruption corrupt the whole thing. A little distortion. And so we don't want the word of God to be distorted. We want to know what God's word says. So he says, not only will you tell them what's wrong, he said, your job is to convince them by rebuking and correcting and warning and urging and encouraging them. So I'm supposed to correct, right? I'm supposed to warn. I'm supposed to encourage. I'm supposed to urge you and to be unflagging and inexhaustible in my patience and in my teaching. So my job, I'm supposed to be patient with you while I'm trying to get you to learn. It's kind of like your kid. How many of you ever potty trained a kid before? I mean, I've potty trained six of them, you know, and, and helping on some other ones. Guess what? Each one of them was different. You know, some of them just got it. Some of them, you know, my, my son Stephen, you know, is a little different. You know, Reagan just, I, we don't even remember potty training. It, it was so easy. You know, it just happened. You know, Heidi was a different situation. You know, Seth was a lot, he was like, it was quicker for him. I think it was quick for him. I'm getting mixed up on him. But anyway, all of it was different. And as a parent, I couldn't throw the baby out with the bath water. I had to learn how to be patient with every last one of them. And then one of them took a few months versus one of them that took a year. I didn't put them in the problem class. I put them in the class that they just developed mentally different. You can hear this. So we got some people that's in the body of Christ that progress a lot quicker than others. Right? We got some that are overachievers. They come in, they get it, and they run with it. We got some that kind of hang in the back, you know. They're not saying that more to the season, sir. You got some just kind of, they, they just hang. You know, they just kind of float. You know, you, you, you try to get a hold of them and help them, you know, but, but it's a little more challenging with them. And you want that one to, just like your kids, you want that one to act like the rest of them. But you're going to ask God for a little more patience so you can help that one to get where the other one is. It gets to be made clear here today. All right. So, he said, be patient and teach. One of the things I say all the time, if you are unteachable, you are unusable. All right? 
If you are unteachable, you are unusable for the kingdom of God. Because every last one of us must maintain a teachable spirit. Right? What it is to have a teachable spirit? Have the ability to be taught. Right? You have the ability to be taught. You know, don't, don't, don't be like um, my son Stephen. He know everything. I mean, he, he's a genius. He knows everything. And so when you try to teach him how to do something, he want to teach you his way. And then my son Seth, he knows everything. You know? It's like, man, you know nothing because you know everything. And the deal is, we want to be in a place to where we are teachable, to where we have the ability to learn, all right? You know, don't cut everybody off all the time. Let people talk to you and tell you what's wrong. Let people explain to you what's really going on. Let's be still and say, Lord, teach me, all right? Teach me, Lord. You know, I need to be reprogrammed. I want you to hear this. I need to be reprogrammed, all right? I want you to hear this, guys. All right, it says here, it goes on to say here in verse 3, it says, the time is coming when people will not tolerate endure sound doctrine and wholesome instruction. Everybody don't like the truth. Everybody don't. Why do you think churches are not filled up in places where the word is being taught like this? Because guess what? Everybody don't want to hear the truth. People don't want to hear their problems. People don't want they want they want it they want it to be like a, like a lie, you know. I want I want to just motivate me, you know. Just give me a good motivational speech and that would be great. But guess what? In the kingdom, it's not just about being motivated, all right? It's about being transformed. It's about being changed. And guess what? In the midst of being changed, you're gonna get some stuff that you don't want to hear. You think I want to hear the doctor say, "Hey, you need to lose some weight." Because guess what? It's going to take work to lose weight. It's going to take some adjustments to lose weight. I think it's getting a little frigid in here. I see people putting their coats on and I feel the breeze. But just, just, just cut it off. Amen. Just cut it off. Everybody get cold. I'm getting cold. Just, I don't know. Just, Lord, help us all. Amen. As we go hot, cold, hot, cold, we'll leave here sick. The weather is like Southern California has got something going on. You know, cold in the morning, 2 o'clock at 2 o'clock. 80 degrees at 2 o'clock. All right, so so the deal is we have to be in the place to where we allow God to change us, all right? We can't be in the place to where we reject good stuff because it don't feel good. It's like rejecting cod liver oil growing up, you know. Nobody want to take cod liver oil. Nobody want to take all this uh, this stuff that doesn't taste, it's not taste well. You know, it's like, ah, oh, you run, you hide, you, you do everything. Let me tell you something. Everything in the kingdom initially don't taste good. Everything that's coming your way, the adjustments that, that, that God is trying to make in us, is not always good. I know the Bible says that God's word is sweet like the honey from a honeycomb. You know, but guess what? When you first fight off of it, you don't get a taste like that. Because guess what? You don't want to make those adjustments. You, you like sugar. You love salt. These are things you've learned to love. And so guess what? When you take a little salt away, the food don't taste the same. When you take the sugar out, you can put stevia, trubia, whatever, trula, you can put whatever. It doesn't taste the same. You can split it until Jesus comes back. It doesn't taste the same. And all of a sudden, you find yourself backsliding. Because all you want is the real thing. So the deal is here, in the kingdom, we have to make some changes. We have to trim down what's been holding us back. I want you to hear this, guys. I want you to get it. Anybody getting it today? Amen. Anybody getting it? Amen. So it says that they will, they'll be in a place to where they're not tolerating the word anymore. They can't tolerate it. So guess what? The first thing they say, I don't want to hear that. Well, I'm not going to church today anymore. It's because I don't like what the pastor's preaching. Well, they say the same thing in heaven, so you've got a problem with going to heaven, too. I mean, because what I'm speaking is what heaven said. What they're speaking is what God said. So if you've got a problem with what's coming out of my mouth, you have a problem with God, not with me. Because guess what? When you go home, your Bible will go with you. And so 
So the word that I spoke, you can read it in your bedroom. You can read it in your car. So it's not just the preacher. You have a God problem. Right? You have a God problem. It's not a preacher problem. So we run from God. Think we run it from the preacher, but we're running from God. Hallelujah. So, so he says here, he said that they're not going to tolerate, they're not going to have the, the capacity to endure sound and wholesome instruction. But, but they're going to have empty ears for something pleasing and gratifying. How many of us here love stuff that, that, that's pleasing and gratifying to you? Well, you're not going to be in sin if you tell the truth. We all do. Come on. We love people to say stuff that is just going to be nice and, you know, you're not really fat. You know, you're just big boned. You know, you, but you're a good looking big bone person. We'll just mask it over. I mean, you're obese. I'm obese. I mean, my God, I'm not playing football anymore. I need to drop this way. I mean, we're just going to tell the truth. I'm not, I'm not trying to tackle the quarterback anymore. I'm trying to be a dad. I don't want about to be pushing me around in the next 20 years. I mean, come on, let's confront these the real hard issues. Well, baby, you're not too big. You know, you, you know, you was pregnant like five years ago. <laughs> Still got baby fat, you know. Come on. I mean, you don't want to be like harsh, you know. But at the same time, I'm talking about reality. I'm not telling you to say that to anybody. I want you to get kicked out of your house or wherever you are. I'm just using an example, right? You know, don't go home being that transparent. I'm just using an example. Don't well, tell your spouse that. Leave that alone. Use an example versus God's word. Right? We don't want to live a lie. It's kind of like, you know, we'll stand in front of a mirror and we'll take pictures in the slim mirror. Come on. I don't want to take pictures in front of no slim mirror. Let me get the image in my head and let me make a real image in my life. You know, Brother Aaron, uh, uh, the photographer company over here, you know, I mean, they're photographers, and so photographers do uh, all this uh, uh, Photoshop, you know. They do it, they put, like all these people you see beautiful in the magazines, they don't look like that. They Photoshop. Yeah. You know, you see them in person, like, oh, what happened to them? You know, so they were showing us their ability to Photoshop. Like, you know, they can make your back disappear. They can make your chin, you know, that right there. They can make you go back. And, you know, they can take out the moles off your face, the blemishes. They can make you look like somebody that needs to be on the front of GQ or something. And he started messing around with me. I said, oh, no, man, I don't like that. You know, Pastor Sean was like, oh, that's amazing. I like that. <laughs> I was like, no, nah, I don't like that. I don't want to look at no pictures in my house, and it ain't the real me. I mean, I was like, if I'm fat, I'm just fat. Let me look fat on the picture. You know, so I can hate that picture. <laughs> See, that's not the spirit we want. I don't want to live a lie. Yeah. You know, I'm like, man, he looks so good, and they see me. I'm fat as I want to be, you know. I mean, I'm just all messed up. And I mean, I know I'm being a little bit graphic, but I'm telling the truth, guys. We, we don't want to live with a vision of something that's not real. Amen. Right? We want to be real. And so everything in this world is it, it, fixed up fictitiously. We want to be real. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So, it says they're not, they're not going to be able to endure sound doctrine, and they're going to look, they're going to, uh, look for uh, something that's going to cause their ears to be, to be itchy. I mean, they're going to have empty ears, and they're going to look for something that's pleasing and gratifying. It says they will gather to themselves one teacher after another to considerable number chosen to satisfy their own liking and to foster their error. You know what, guys? I don't want to hang with people that's going to foster my error. I don't mean, I'm telling you, I want, I want people to be real with me. Right? I want people to be real with me. I want you to say this. Come on. If you don't, if this is not your confession, I just want you to start conforming today. I want you to say, I want people to be real with me. Come on, it sounds like one or two people here. Let's say it again. I want people to be real with me. I want people to be real with me. And I want to be real with people. And I want to be real with people. So then I'll be labeled as a real person. So then I'll be labeled as a real person. Come on. You know what I'm saying? And I don't want to hang around people that can't be real with me. Right? Be real with me. If I got a ketchup stain, let me know I got a ketchup stain. I don't want to walk around all day smelling like mustard and you and I are supposed to be tight and you didn't tell me. I mean, like we hanging together.
together. I want you to be concerned about my image. You know, walking around, I got mucus right here, looking like Rasco from Martin, you know. Uh, it, it, you know, uh, tell me. You know, it's like, hey, come here, tell me. Tell me. It's like, hey, hey bro, here's a napkin. You know, and so if somebody offers you a napkin, I ain't even have to tell you what's going on. You're going to be like, oh, oh okay. You know, you're going to check yourself. You know, tell me what's going on. Yeah. Don't let me walk around being dysfunctional when God has given you truth in your mouth to help me. I mean, if somebody would have sent Whitney Houston down and quit front with her, maybe she still would have been alive today. That girl hung out with pastors. She was best friends with pastors. I mean, they opened up their house, their life to her, and that she is dead in the Beverly Hills Hotel because guess what? Everybody around her wasn't being real with her. You know, Michael Jackson, his mom didn't knew he had issues. They're going trying to bite this man, Conrad, whatever his name is. You know what I mean? My God, everybody knew Mike had issues because everybody started talking since he's dead now. We knew he had issues. We knew something was going on. But why did anybody try to do anything? Because you really cared about them. You could have saved their life by doing something. Let me tell you something. Telling people the truth may cost you a relationship, but it may save their life. Amen. Let me say that again. Telling people the truth may cause you the relationship with that person, but you never know it may be the thing that saved their life. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. We're talking, we talking some serious stuff here today. You know, if we're going to come here, let's deal with some serious stuff. We're talking about foundational stuff. So, so, so I don't want anybody to foster my error. If you're in a church, if you're in a place when the preacher preaches with a male or female, if that word is not helping you to be corrected, to be encouraged, to be conforming to the kingdom, you need to find another place. You need to be in a place to where things are changing on the inside of you. You know, I see when we're in a social club, that don't happen. It's not a social club. We will socialize, but this is not a social club in this junction. Time for us to know what God's word says. Amen. So it says in verse 4, what's going to happen to these type of people is that they're going to turn aside from hearing the truth and they're going to wander off into myths and man-made fiction. Was that the word what? It says that the, this is the process. In the process of people not wanting to do a sound doctrine, the Bible says that they're going to wander off, they're going to have a vagabond and nomadic spirit, they're going to wander off, and then they're going to start entertaining stuff that's man-made and it's fictional. Then they're going to start questioning whether Jesus, whether Jesus really came. Then they're going to start questioning whether they should even be in church. And then they're going to start questioning whether, whether the blood is really the blood. You know, what those people doing over there? I don't go to church anymore because I got a revelation. You don't supposed to do church. You know, you just fall into all kind of man-made traditions. All fake, fake stuff. Stuff that's not real. Stuff that's not legitimate. It's man-made. It's man thoughts. It's man's tradition. You know, it's kind of like somebody said, well, God, God ain't going to send you to hell. Guess what? That's right. God ain't going to send anybody to hell. You send yourself. He gave a way for us to go to heaven. Anybody that a human goes to hell, it's because you chose to go to hell. If you go to hell, it's because you made the choice to. It's not because God said, I'm going to send you to hell. You choose to go to hell. Because you choose Jesus, you choose life. You choose the world, you choose death, and you choose hell. It's just the way it is. Amen? So we got to change our thinking and our view on how we view that. So, Paul told Timothy, he said, as for you, be calm, be cool, be steady, and accept, suffer uninflictingly every hardship. Because when you preach a word like this, a word like this brings hardship. A word like this brings persecution. A word like this brings a distaste to the majority. Right? This is not famous. It's not something that everybody wants to hear. Now, this message right here is not blowing up the ratings in the earth. It's blowing up the ratings in heaven, but in the earth it's not blowing up the ratings. Because, because man is not, is not hype about this message. 
This message right here calls you and I. We have to change. Can't be the same any longer. Hallelujah. So, so he says, accept every hardship and do the work of evangelists, meaning keep telling people. Keep telling people. Wherever you go, keep telling people. Don't stop telling people because they close you down over here. Don't stop telling people because they turn away from you over here. Keep telling people. That's what an evangelist do. Evangelize, they tell people. And fully perform all the duties of your ministry. So let me tell you something. I will never ever be Muslim out. Meaning that I will never be in a place to where I'm not going to tell the word of God. It doesn't matter who come or who don't come. Yeah, I want people to come. But my job is to tell the truth. And if I'm not telling the truth, I'm, I'm in trouble with God. And I'm not going to get in trouble with God versus what man got going on. Right. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4, you can go there with me. You just go to the left, verse 1. We're just covering the groundwork of understanding what, what we are. This is what we are. I want you to hear this. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. We want to get to a place to where to where you can you, you can know what's going on. The Bible says here in 1 Timothy verse 1. It says in the King James Version, it said, Now the Spirit speaketh expressively that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's the King James Version. Anybody else got another type of version out there? Anybody? NIV? New American Translation? I got another version here, but I want to see what you got. Anybody? Everybody KJV here? Oh, that's fine. What do you got? What you got? Yeah. Come on, can you speak up? Speak a little bit. Just read that a little lot. See, because that's what I wanted to hear. I know what it meant, but I want everybody else to do it. Go ahead. That's the word I'm looking for. Abandon. Keep going. I love that. Taught by demons. That's what I was looking for right there. Taught by demons. All right, I want to read it to you and amplify it. It says, but the Holy Spirit distinctively and expressively declares that in the latter times, some will turn away from the faith, giving attention to deluding and seducing spirits and doctrines that demons are teaching. Now, let, let, me, let, me, let me present a question to you. Because in the next few weeks, I'm going to be teaching on salvation. I just know I'm, I'm going to tell you to do an in depth teaching on salvation and grace. I'm going to do it. In the next weeks. I don't know, I didn't say next week, just the next week, so I don't know exactly when, but that's just one of the next things that's coming. Because we're, we're being tested foundationally. The church is being tested foundationally, so when the foundation is being tested, we have to reestablish what's already been established, because a lot of people are listening to damnable heresies. The Bible says over in 2 Peter, it says they will creep in and they will bring in damnable heresies among God's people to cause people to turn away from God. Now I want you to hear this. The Bible says that, who, who said this first of all? Who said it? The Spirit, right? It said the Holy Spirit is speaking expressively. That's what it says. It said the Spirit of God is speaking that in the latter times, later on, People are going to start turning away from God. All right? It said people are going to start turning away from the faith. Right? How could you turn away from the faith if you've never been in the faith? See, that's a doctor we're going to deal with. How could you turn away from something that you've never been a part of? They tell us you can't turn away from God. They tell us you can't walk away from God. And they're teaching right now. Our renowned preachers that are teaching right now is that once you save, you save. That's it. You good. Let me tell you something. You have the ability. I have the ability to walk away from God because in your salvation, it does not take away your choice. It's like me being a man. I'm, I, I am. I'm so much man. I have to just God give me a little more. Give me some femininity. Just let me just help twerk me a little bit. 
You know, because I'm like mundane, you know. I'm, I'm mandingo, you know. I mean, I'm a man. I make sure my girls be girls, you know, because I'm a man. You know, and I'm not hitting anybody, but I'm a man, you know. You know, I was raised man. I'm just like, you know, I'm one of the football player hunters, you know. But anyway, the deal is, I'm not walking around here thinking I'm a hunter. Right? There are people that go to the extreme, right? They are born men or born women, but they get it in their mind that they're not a man, they're not a woman. And so they even take surgical surgical procedures to change that. They choose to do that. There are people that live their life, all right, as women that really are men. They were born men, but they changed. Because guess what? God will never take away the power of choice. You have the power of choice. So guess what? You choose to be saved. You choose to walk to heaven. You think God was walking around heaven saying, I'm looking for what angel I can kick out. You think God was walking around saying, I'm going to kick a third of the angels out sooner or later. No, he didn't. Guess what? Satan chose to leave. Because guess what? As soon as he decided to allow pride to be lifted up in his heart, his decision put him out. Come on, guys, can you see it? Yeah. Because guess what? God wasn't walking around looking to put nobody out. But when he chose to disobey God, he chose to get out. So guess what? You can walk away from anybody you want to. God's not going to keep you. If all of a sudden you say, you know what? I don't believe this Christian thing and I want to be a witch now. People, people, they've been doing it for years. You know, I just want to be a new ager now. You know, because guess what? I've been overcome with a different system now. The Bible said it's better for a man to never have known the way to have known the way and turn back. What you mean? Known the way? We're we going to deal with that. And I'm, I'm going I'm to take time and read the Greek and the Hebrew to you so you can know it's just not some interpretation. People need to know what God's word says. So he says that people are going to turn away from the faith. The word turn away or depart from the faith because it's depart from the faith in the King James Version. And the King James Version it is one of the only versions that has the strong concordance that's linked to it, all right, that gives us interpretation or to give us the original word, all right? The word here for depart from the faith is episteme. It's episteme, and it means to remove, to draw back, to fall away, to separate oneself. To separate one's self, to fall away, right? It says that they're going to fall away from the faith. And the word faith here in the Greek, the word is pistis. P-I-S-T-I-S. And it means their moral conviction, especially the reliance upon Jesus Christ for their salvation. They fall away from their moral conviction. And their moral conviction, especially their reliance upon Jesus Christ for salvation. Because Jesus Christ is salvation. Jesus Christ gave us salvation. And so if you fall away from the faith, you fall away from Christ. You fall away from the doctrine of Christ. You fall away from that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Because the Bible tells us, it said that the day would come that they will get to the place to where they even denied that Jesus Christ came in the flesh to save humanity. It said that the day would come that they would even deny that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Bible says. So it says they turn away from the faith and the way they turn away, they gave attention to what? Seducing spirits, deluded teachings, seducing spirits, and doctrines that demons teach. So guess what? The way we are led away is how? We're seduced, but seduction is a process. You don't walk in and somebody seduce all of a sudden. Seduction is a process. <laughs> you know, you seduce, you, you seduce over time. You know, 
And so, so when a person is seduced, you are mentally undressed and your guards are let down and you begin to allow in what never should have been allowed. All right? We dealt with some of this on Wednesday, on Thursday night, talking about guarding your mind. Because we let we entertain certain thought patterns that we should never entertain. Right? I want you to hear this. I want you, I want you to hear this. The Bible says that this doctrine is taught by demons. Right? How am I going to be taught by a demon? If you know I'm a demon, chances are you're not going to listen. But if I'm a man possessed with a devil, and I'm teaching you something that is demonically influenced, you are being seduced and taught doctrines that demons have promoted. Like Jesus is not Messiah. Is that, that, that you can do whatever you want to, that grace is going to cover you. That contradicts God's word. You can't live any kind of way. You have to be obedient. That's the standard of living that God has given us. You know, God is merciful. He ain't going to send you to hell. You're right. But you'll send yourself to hell. Jesus said, if you love me, you won't just go around doing anything. So how are we going to contradict the, the word of God? If you love Christ, you're going to live right. And in the midst of your living right, you may, you're may going to have some days when things are not all the way they should be. But there's grace for that. You have some days when, when you commit sin. Because we all sin. Every day of your life you sin, but you don't live a lifestyle of sin. You don't have a common practice of sin. You know, sometimes we say things that are offensive to God. It's sin. Sometimes we think, things, think some things that we act out. They're sin, and we shouldn't do it. And so we go to God according to Romans, according to uh, 1 John chapter 1. It says that we confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse of all righteousness, right? Okay, so why, why are we confessing sin? If it's okay, why, why even? I heard a preacher say, you ain't even got to confess your sin no more. Why the Bible tell me to confess my sin then? I mean, these are damnable heresies. We tell the people, you ain't got to confess sin no more. Because guess what? It doesn't matter what you've done. You can't mess it up. Let me tell you something. There's a line somewhere. I don't know what a line is, and I don't even want to know. I want to stay so close to God. And I want the grace of God to continue to cover me like it's going to cover you. Because we, we, we reverence God. Why does the Bible say, live out your days in fear and trembling? Why, why, why do you say, just go do what you want to do? Since you've accepted me, just live the way you want to live. You know, just get drunk as you want to get drunk. And then over in John, it gives that whole list of saying, drunkards, whoremongers, liars, blah, 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 shall all, they shall all not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But you go do what you want to do. And the Bible says you're not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven if you in this list. See, the deal, this is the deal, man. This is the deal. When we love God, we stay clear of that type of foolishness. And when it arises, we start putting it away because it's offensive to God. And the spirit of God that's on the inside of you confirms with your spirit that it's not of God. They say, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, every last one of us have the ability to do what's wrong. Every last one of us. It doesn't matter how I say you are. But if the Spirit of God lives on the inside of you and I, the Spirit of God is going to encourage you, empower you, and lead you and I into what's right. You know, how many of you ever read the 20, 20, 23rd Psalms? You ever read the 23rd Psalms? All right. The Bible said, he leadeth me. In the paths of righteousness, come on, come on, where's he leading you? Lead me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. All right, so guess what? I'm being led in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Okay, if it's okay to be to, to do what's wrong, why is why is the Spirit of God leading me in the paths of righteousness? If it's okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. Does anybody follow me in this place today? Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Is anybody getting anything? That's what I want to know. Amen. And will somebody read that scripture to me once you get there? What do you guys? Just anybody. Go ahead. Let her read back there. Just let her read. Come on. 
one started off. Go ahead. Or you go ahead. Whichever one of y'all choose. So, if the Bible tells, if the Bible say, be, be in a position, Timothy, Paul told Timothy, to rightly divide the word, that means that it is a wrong way. Right? If he tells him to rightly divide the word, that is a wrong way to divide God's word. Right? So, everybody that's preaching out the Bible ain't preaching the Bible. And everybody that's interpreting and chopping up scripture, they're not interpreting and chopping it up the way God said. That's the reason you have to read your Bible. Hallelujah. So he said that if, if, if you study to show yourself approved under God, he said you'll be like a workman that, that has no need to be a slave. You don't have to walk in shame because guess what? You're rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be firm, be steadfast, be immovable, always abide in the work of the Lord. Always being superior, excelling, doing more than enough in the service of the Lord. Knowing and being continually aware that your labor is in the Lord. It's not fruitile. It is never wasted or to no purpose. Now let me tell you something. This is a powerful scripture for you to get. Because the devil will tell you and he will fool you that what you're doing for God ain't worth doing. Whatever you do for the Lord, the Bible says that you're not wasting your time. That is purpose. I don't care if you're singing. I don't care if you're dancing. I don't care if you're sewing. I don't care what you're doing. If you're doing it for the glory of God, it's going to be a blessing in your life because God is going to reward you and I for what we've done. So don't ever let the devil get in your ear. He will get in your ear. And he will start saying things that, that's not kosher. Things that are not proper. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. And I'm going to just go ahead and read this out of the Amplified for uh, sake of time. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 through 16. Ephesians 4, verse 14 through 16. It says in Ephesians 4, it says, So then, we may no longer be children tossed like ships to and fro between chance gusts of teaching. It's just amazing that God wrote this like this. It says that, that we will no longer be tossed like ships to and fro between chance gusts of teaching and wavering with every change in wind of doctrine. The prey of the cunning and cleverness of a unscrupulous men gamblers Engage in every shifting form of trickery in inventing error to mislead. Said, rather let our lives lovingly express truth. Let your what? Your life express the truth you believe. Don't lead with your mouth, lead with your life. It says, in all things, speaking truly, dealing truly, living truly. In fall in love, let us grow up in every way and in all things into him who is the head, even Christ the Messiah, the anointed one. It says, for because of him, the whole body, the church, and all its various parts closely joined and firmly knit together by the joints and the ligaments with which it is supplied when each part with power adapted to its needs is working properly in all functions grows to full maturity, building itself up to lo for love. Building itself up in love. Now let me tell you something here, guys. The Bible says that it should come a time in our life that we are not infants any longer. Right? It, it should come a time to where we're growing up in the faith. Meaning that we're not doing juvenile stuff any longer. We're not doing infant stuff any longer. The Bible says that when we, when we grow up, we need to put away childish ways. And we got a lot of childish ways that's in the body of Christ that we need to put away. 
I want you to hear me. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. All right? We work harder for the world than we do the kingdom. All right? I know some of us might not even like this, but I'm going to preach the truth. We put more energy into the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of humanity than the kingdom of light. My boss tell us to be on time. We have 30 minutes early. Amen. They tell us to work late. We late. We work long as they tell us to work. But we come in the house of God and service go over 30 minutes and your face turn a different color. Amen. These are things that we need to make adjustments in our life. We don't handle the kingdom the way we should. We come to church anytime we want to because we know the people or the preacher ain't going to fire you. But you won't be late to that job because that job got you hooked in with hooks in your life. Want you to hear? We got to grow up. People, somebody look at us wrong or look at us a certain way. We get all cool to kente on. That's immaturity. They was looking at me crazy. They were saying things that they shouldn't say. Guess what? That's immature stuff. We got to be in a place to where we learn how to forgive people. We got to be in a place to where we learn how to move beyond our, our, our sensual and emotional feelings. My God, all are seeing and falling short of the glory of God. We need to understand that we are righteous and we are holy. And we are not going to allow things to keep us away from the presence and the progression of Almighty God. God is calling us to a higher place. He's calling us to a greater place. A place that we think like kings. A place where we live like queens. And a place where we demonstrate the kingdom in a way that we've never ever thought about. we got to get sharp. we got to be militant. we got to stand on our feet. When God say move, we got to be ready to move. We fall out of church over anything. We fall out of things over anything. Well, the service was too long. Well, the service was too late. Uh, the song was too loud. The music was too loud. The preacher preached too much. He talked too much. That ain't your business. Your business is to be on point and to stand for the kingdom of God. That's your responsibility. That's your responsibility. That's our responsibility. It's time that we pray longer. It's time that we praise harder. It's time that we worship. It's time that we dance. It's time that we hug and love. That's what time it is. It's game time. Everything is on the line right now. We sit back and want to be casual. The devil ain't casual. He'll mess your mind up. Mess your children mind up. He'll take your husband from you. He'll take your wife from you. He'll kill your mother-in-law. He'll do whatever he can. He'll empty your bank account out. He'll sabotage your car so you can have an accident. It's time for us to stand up and do what does set the Lord now. We're too passive in the body of Christ. My God, we come in for Jesus. We're not coming here just for a man or just for a woman. We're coming in for the Lord. I don't know about you. I might be the preacher, but I want God to do something in me. And whatever it takes for God to do something in me, Lord, I'm willing. I'm able. I'm ready, God. Whatever you want to do, give me the grace. What's needed to walk through whatever moment, whatever dark alley, whatever rough street, whatever crooked road you want me to walk through. Give me the strength, God. A lot of times we crying to get out of something that we need to be praying and say, God, give me the grace to make it. Because I know if I can make it to the other side, that there's a reward on the other side. If I can make it to the next phase of my life, that there's, there's refreshment on the other side. Sometimes we kick over and we get in before we get to our place of refreshment. You know, when I think about this, I think about like video games that I play. Because there's been some video games and stuff and and, uh, you know, if we're playing the video game, especially if you're like in an arcade and you're driving on that video video game and you're trying to make it to a certain point, because if you make it to your rally point, they're going to extend your time. And many of us, we kick over and we kill out before we get to the place where God going to give you the rations you need to make it to the next day. You think God was going to let Elijah die at the brook Sharif when the brook dried up? The devil in his mother-in-law is a liar. My God, he had a woman that was in Zarephath that God was going to use to sustain the man of God in the midst of the drought. And so let me tell you something. When God sustained the man of God or the woman of God, God put enough in that man of God, in that woman of God, to bring you the spirit of sustaining. You say, well, I can make it on my own. Let me tell you something. God used a system and the system was the woman of God, the widow in Zarephath, she had the ability to give. The man that God had the ability to receive and God had the ability to release blessing. That 
blessing was released to restore her. That blessing was released to preserve her. God always has a system. Do you believe every lie that the devil tell you? Yeah, you do got to come to church. People say, well, you got to come to church. You do got to come to church. Read Hebrews chapter 10. Read your word. The Bible said, don't forsake the assembly. As we see the day approaching, gathering together with one another. You can't get a miss. You're going to flunk out of life. You know, when I was in college, when I missed, missed class, I failed that class. Every class that I missed, I failed it. And I sit up in the room getting drunk when I didn't know the Lord, playing uh, uh, John Matt. I did have a degree in John Matt football. Because we sit up. Ten minutes ago, this is time you got to get across the bridge, when I, and I got to go to class, and I got to walk to class. And I'm sitting down in the fourth quarter in a video game, and the video game operated in more dominion over me than the spirit. And I'm saying, man, I can't, I can't miss this because if I win this game, my God, it's gonna mean something. That was a, that was a mind trick of the enemy. And now I'm playing a game that I own. And I'm filling out of school that I just paid $1,500 for the semester. And now I'm flunking out of something that I'm paying for. And something that I own is mastering me and causing me to fail. Question for you, what you want to do in life? The question for you today, what you want to do in life? It's time for us to lay hold, take hold of the reins and say in the name of Jesus, Lord, wherever you're going to take me, I'm going. Whatever you're going to do, Lord, I'm doing it. My God, forget what everybody is saying. Forget, forget what everybody is saying. You press it in. You press it in for your life. You press it in for children that are unborn to time, the next generation. God is calling you. He's calling you. He's calling you. He's calling you right now. What you gonna do? What you gonna do? He's calling you right now. So the Bible says that we're not gonna walk around here uh, allowing every little the newest word. What's the newest word? Trip us up. That's some things that ought to be settled in you. That's some things that ought to be settled in me. You know? My God, you know that sexual sin is wrong. It ought to be settled in you. When you wage, when you wage that battle, you better throw that body on the altar and say, Lord, take the fire out of my flesh. Yeah. I'm preaching better than you saying amen, amen. Because some of us, we get heated in certain moments of life. You went the whole week doing well. And all of a sudden, the flesh starts burning. All of a sudden, you start feeling a certain type of way. You need to lay yourself on the altar and say, Lord, take the stain of death out of my flesh. Take this fire, this desire to get involved in sexual sin. Take it out of me, God. I'm telling you something that, that I know. When I got saved, I had to walk in purity. I had to walk in holiness. You go from sleeping around to doing nothing because now you hooked up with God. And these things are fit, these things are fit God. And you begin to cry and say, God, send me a husband. Send me a wife, God. I don't want to be alone, God. And I don't want to be in sexual sin, God. These things start rising up in you. You start asking God to break these things off of you. Break every chain off of you. Break every mental limitation off of you. Break it off of me, God. Because that's what God is going to do for you. God is a holy God. And he's raising up a holy people. He's raising up a righteous people. Don't you listen to the lies of the enemy. Tell you, well, you ain't got to kill. Yeah, you do. You ain't got to pray. Yeah, you do. People say, well, you ain't got to pray. I don't pray no more. I don't give no more. I don't do nothing no more. It's my life. You might be on your way to hell. These are things we need to read, read, Samuel. We should have a prayer life. Well, I don't believe in that. Samuel said that it was a sin not to pray. We should have a prayer life. The Bible tells us we're supposed to give. We're supposed to be givers versus being receivers. God didn't say don't receive, but he said it's better to give than to receive. We're supposed to be in covenant with God. We're supposed to pray and ask God to break things off of us. We're supposed to declare the blood of Jesus Christ. We're supposed to speak and confess and declare these things. We're supposed to live in fear and tremble with the Lord. Reverence God. Reverence God. The Bible says we're not going to allow the devil to trip us up in all. We're going to grow up. We're going to, in 2014, we're growing up. We're growing up. The stuff that matched you in 2013, you can say, tonight I will that. No, I'm moving forward. I'm not going to make excuses. I can, I can go everywhere else, but I can't go to church. People say, I ain't got no gas to go to church. I ain't got no gas. You got gas to go everywhere else. Well, I ain't got a way. I ain't got a way. 
You can catch a ride everywhere else. You know, we do what we want to do when we want to do it. Amen. We do what we want to do when we want to do it. So let's quit making excuses. Come on, hear what I'm saying here. Let's quit making excuses, guys. Let's quit making excuses. Because we believe, Lord, we believe. Is there a believe in the building? Is there a believe in the building? Is there a believe in the building? We believe, Lord. We believe, Lord. We're going to stop making excuses and start doing. I want you to make that commitment. We're going to start doing. We're going to start doing. We're going to start doing right now. Hallelujah. No more excuses. I'm almost finished. No more excuses. No more excuses. My God, I hear it. I hear I hear keys tuning up in here. No, no more excuses. No more excuses. Can't blame your mama. Can't blame your daddy. Can't blame your husband you got divorced with. Can't blame the wife you divorced. Can't blame the children that caused you problems. You can't blame nobody. Everybody got a story. My God, if you was molested, somebody else was molested. My God, if you was raped, somebody else was raped. If you was beat up, somebody else was beat up. My God, we're not trying to be insensitive to what you've been through. But by God, we all got a story. My God, you ain't the only one that grew up without a daddy. My God, you ain't the only one that grew up in an orphanage. You ain't the only one that came from a broken family. We all got a story. Let's stand up and say, God, heal my broken heart, God. Heal my fragmented life, God. You ain't the only one got a parent that suffered with suffering abuse. My God, everybody got a story. What you gonna do now? I'm gonna get up and do something. I'm not gonna allow the enemy to keep me boxed in. I'm not gonna allow the devil to keep me down. I'm going to break every limitation in the name of Jesus. I will be the first one to graduate. I will be the first one to buy a house. I will be the first one to get a marriage. I will be the first one with a family. I will be that one. You need to declare that no divorce is going to be dominating in my life. You need to declare in the name of Jesus that your children, whether fatherless or motherless, they will make it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's all about what you want. It's all about what you want. What you gonna do with what you got? It's all about what you want. What you gonna do with what you got? It's all about what you want. I know we get tired. I know we get weary sometimes. But there's enough grace that flows from the throne of grace that help you through your tiredness, that help you through your weariness, that help you through your place of desolation and mental confusion. There's enough peace. The flow from the throne of grace to help you right track it. I want you to declare today that you're going to right track it. I ain't saying get on the right track. You're going to right track it. I'm going to change my I'm going to right track it. I'm going to do what's right opposed to what's wrong. I'm going to do what dust said the Lord. My God, with sweat coming out of my pores and with blood coming out of my body, with snot coming out of my nose. I know it's a little vulgar, but by God, I'm going to do it. I may be bleeding, but I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it in Jesus' name. My God, I'm going to do it. I'm going to overcome in Jesus' name. The Bible says that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the Word of our testimony. My question for you today is what is your testimony? Yeah, you have tests. You will have no tests. But by golly, I won't have the bonus. We can put the test and the money together in the overcoming name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and we shall conquer in Jesus' name. You ought to get excited about it. We get excited at a Saints game. We get excited at a, at a San Francisco game, 49 game. We get excited at a Charger game when they beat the Broncos the other night. But by golly, we're going to get excited with Jesus. My God, we got Candlestick Park up in here. My God, fireworks are going off in the name of Jesus because we believe God. We're going to preach somebody out of their hell hole. We're going to preach somebody out of their place of mental confusion. We're going to preach you out of your place of desolation and drought and famine. We're going to preach you into a place where the kingdom of God is manifested on the inside of you. Great is he that's in me than he that's in the world. It doesn't matter what the devil throw at you. It doesn't matter what he throw at you. The blood of Jesus is greater. The hand of God is upon you. You have been anointed for seven times now. You've been appointed for seven times now. Every limitation that's on your life must be broken now in the name of Jesus. The glory of God is coming upon you. You have been anointed, Joseph. You have been anointed, David. You have been called out, Samuel. You have been called out, Anna. You have been called out, Simon. This is your hour, Peter. The finest hour that you've ever known. 3,000 is about to be added to the church. 5,000 is coming in. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is about to be manifest. You can't give up now, Peter. I know it's hard. I know you denied Jesus, but if you can 
find your way to your prayer room, if you can find your way to your knees, there's enough grace, there's enough blood that flows from the throne of heaven that can redeem you and bring you back in. I don't care what the devil has told you. Don't believe the lie. God is for you. And if God be for you, who in all of hell can be against you? You ought to give him praise today. Come on, you ought to give him praise. Sometimes we got to be preached at. Sometimes we got to be prayed at. Sometimes we got to be pulled at. Sometimes we just got to be thrown at. Baby, if the devil swallow me, we're going to give him problems on the inside. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. If your life seems to be swallowed up by the devil, my God, we're going to have a Jonah moment. You're going to have to throw me up. I got too much destiny on the inside of me that's on the inside of the devil. He got to spit me out because I'm not going to be tasting good to him. I'm not a delicacy for the devil. You need to declare in the name of Jesus that the grave can't hold you. You need to declare that the sting that the death has tried to put in you. You need to declare that death has no sting over you. You need to declare that the dominion that's operating in your life is the kingdom. You need to declare it now. Don't wait. You need to declare it now. Last thing I want to say today, and I got to stop. Last thing I want to say. Doesn't matter what lie the enemy has spoken to you. That's